Welcome to lecture 3.3, Normal Subgroups. Last time, we learned that for any subgroup H of G, the left cosets of H partition G, the right cosets also partition, and these two partitions need not be the same. I actually like these two pictures of this because it shows how you could have a subgroup H and the left cosets partition the group one way, like this, and the right cosets partition the other way. And you still could have certain left cosets like this one or this one that are equal to their right cosets, but then you have other left cosets like this one which are not equal to their corresponding right cosets. Subgroups whose left and right cosets agree, in other words, not a subgroup like this H, have very special properties, and this is the topic of this lecture. Here's the main definition of the lecture. So a subgroup, H of G, is normal, or a normal subgroup, if GH equals HG for all group elements, little g. In other words, if every left coset is also a right coset. So we denote this with this little triangle symbol, and these two symbols mean exactly the same thing. So like subgroups, this thing does not necessarily mean that H is a proper subgroup of G, these things could actually be equal. So a quick observation, subgroups of abelian groups are always normal. Because take any subgroup, H, and assume that G is abelian. Then the left subgroup is all elements that look like this, A times something in H. And since A and H commute, that equals H times A. And that set is the right coset, HA. So here's an example, and I will include a picture as well. So consider the subgroup uh, generated by 0, 1 in Z3 cross Z3. So it's, again, under addition, it's the three elements 0, 0, 0, 1, and 0, 2. And let's take G to be this element 1, 0. And addition, of course, is done modulo 3, component-wise. So this depicts the equality of the left coset and the right coset. So recall that the left coset, uh, let's start at the identity element, and then add G, and then follow all of the arrows in H, meaning all of the blue arrows, and you get these elements right here. Now, the right coset, we start at the identity, and we first add all of the H arrows. So we get these three nodes, and then from each one of these, we add G. So that takes these three nodes to these three nodes down here. So in other words, the left coset, G plus H, is the same as the right coset, H plus G. As we just saw, subgroups of abelian groups are always normal. And so we will be particularly interested in normal subgroups of non-abelian groups. Here's an example. So let's consider the subgroup N consisting of these three elements in D3. Now I'm denoting the subgroup by N because it is indeed normal, meaning the left and the right cosets are the same. And I'll show you why in a moment. So, that, so one coset, of course, is N itself this. And then the other coset is everything else, and that's all there is. So it doesn't matter if we write that as n times f or f times n. And, uh, and let me show you why explicitly. So n times f is what you get when you attach f to the right of these three elements. So you get f, r, f, and r squared f. And now fn, on the other hand, is what you get when you multiply these three elements on the left by n. So in other words, let me do that up here. So that would be f, that would be f r, and that would be f r squared. And now notice that these things don't match up perfectly. These are not the same and these are not the same. However, those two are the same and those two are the same. So as a set, this element here, Fn, that left coset, is the same as this, I, said, I should say, this set here, in other words, this coset, 
nf, this right coset. So here's a picture of this equality. So let's do what we did before, start at the identity. And the left coset is what you get when you, when you do f, and then you follow the n arrows, which are all the red arrows. We get to the green nodes. On the other hand, if we first start at the identity and follow the n arrows, i.e. the red arrows, and then from each of those we move out and follow the f path, n and then f, then we get to those same nodes. Here's another way to visualize the normality of the subgroup n, which is generated by r. So this depicts the left cosets. One of them, of course, is n. And the other one is fn, these three elements. And of course, there's different ways we could write that. We could write this as rfn, or we could write this as r squared fn. Any of these representatives, remember from the previous lecture, will give us this coset. Now let's look at the right cosets. Well, one of them is still n. And then the other right coset is forced. It's everything else. It has to be the same as the other left coset. And as before, this thing here, if we wanted to, we could write this as n r f or n r squared f. We usually pick the simplest representative, so we call it n f. Now, on contrast, or actually it should be in contrast, right? The subgroup H generated by F is not normal. Here's the subgroup. Its left cosets are these two sets, and its right cosets are these two sets. Here's a quick proposition that hopefully is clear from this picture up here. If H is a subgroup of G, of index 2, remember the index is the number of cosets, then H is normal. See, it has to be. There's only one other left coset, and there's only one other right coset, and they have to be the same. Now, I want to show you an alternate way to think about normal subgroups. So for a fixed element, little g in our group, the set g h g inverse is defined as all products of the form little g h, little g inverse, where h ranges throughout the whole subgroup. And this is called the conjugate of h by g. This should remind you of similar matrices. Remember that when you take a matrix A and you do like a P, P inverse, something like that, to get another matrix. Maybe it was D or something else. Let's make some observations which will connect these to normal subgroups. So first of all, for any element, little g, the conjugate of H by G, this guy, is a subgroup. So to prove this, we need to show three things. First of all, that it contains the identity. In other words, that we can write the identity as something like this. And of course we can. Here's how to do it. Just take the identity element, which has to be in, G, in H, and conjugate it by G. Next, we have to show that this set is closed under the binary operation. In other words, if we multiply two elements of this form together, we get another element of that form. And here's why that's true. Notice if you multiply two elements in, in this set, these two, G, well, the G and the G universe will cancel, leaving us with this element, which of course is in the set because H1, H2 is in H. Now finally, so what do you think the inverse of this element is, G, H, G inverse? Well, how about G, H inverse, G inverse? So I claim that's true. In other words, the inverse of this is, is that. And let's, let's just check this. So G, H, G inverse. Let's check that if we multiply that by G, H inverse, G inverse. So again, I'm multiplying this element by its claimed inverse, this thing. Notice what happens. So the, the G inverse and the G cancels. The H and the H inverse then cancels. And finally, this G cancels with that G inverse. And we are indeed left with the identity. So our second observation 
this proof I will leave as an easy exercise, is that g h1 g inverse and g h2 inverse are equal if and only if h1 equals h2. I should mention that also on the homework, you will show that these two subgroups, h and any conjugate of h, are actually isomorphic, meaning they have the same structure. Now technically, we don't know what that means formally, we just have a general idea of the concept, and so we will have to save that for the next series of lectures. At this point, let's return to the topic of the lecture, that is normal subgroups. Let's suppose we have a subgroup h and an element little g, such that gh, this left coset, equals the right coset hg. Now I'm not assuming h is normal, I'm not assuming that this holds for all elements, but it holds for this element little g. Then in that case, if we right multiply both sides of this equation by g inverse, then the left side becomes gh g inverse, and the right side becomes hg g inverse, which is just h. So we get this equality. This gives us a new way to check whether a subgroup h is normal in g. So previously we know is that h is normal if every left coset equals every right coset. So equivalently, we can just check that every conjugate of h is h. So let's summarize what we know about normal subgroups in this useful remark, and I call it useful because I'm going to show you three different ways to check whether a subgroup is normal. So the following conditions are all equivalent to the subgroup h of g being normal. First of all, gh equals hg for all elements g. In other words, every left coset is a right coset. Secondly, gh g inverse equals h for all elements g. In other words, there is only one conjugate subgroup. And finally, and finally, the only way that the second condition is going to be true is if every conjugate of an element in H, in other words, if every G H G inverse has to remain inside of H. In other words, H is closed under the operation of conjugation. I like to show you these three ways and summarize them in this big red box because sometimes one of these methods is much easier than the others. For example, if you suspect that a subgroup H is not normal, then all it takes to show that H is not normal is to find a single element, H, or little h, whose conjugate does not lie in H. If you can do that, then automatically H is not normal. You don't need to check every single left and right coset or every single conjugate. As another example, as we further develop the theory of groups, sometimes we'll learn extra information, like G might have a unique subgroup of a given size. So if H is such a subgroup, then every conjugate of H, so this, this second remark right here, every conjugate of H has to be H itself, because there only is one subgroup of that size. If that happens, then H must be normal, because this condition has to hold. And this may seem like an odd condition, knowing that G has a unique subgroup of a given size, but this is just the kind of thing that we will discover when we start learning more deeper mathematics, such as the CELO theorems. So that's something you can look forward to in the near future.